Katerina Cat Stratford is a fiery woman. This witty teen is passionate about her principles and unapologetic about being a rage-filled badass. People perceive you as somewhat tempestuous. Over 20 years after its release, 10 Things I Hate About You still stands out for its unorthodox rom-com heroine. Likes, Thai food, feminist prose, and angry girl music of the indie rock persuasion who spurned her genre's conventions about the ideal protagonist, embraced 90s feminism, and provided a refreshing update to the Kate of Shakespearean Taming of the Shrew fame. Because then I'd have to start taking out girls who actually like me. Like you could find one. Oh, see that, there. Who needs affection when I have blind hatred? Still, like the play that inspired it, over the years, 10 Things I Hate About You has attracted controversy over whether it's truly empowering to women. After all, it contains some retrograde ideas, like that it's forgivable to accept money to trick someone into dating you, and that an angry woman is really in need of the loving embrace of a hot guy, in this case, Heath Ledger's charming bad boy, Patrick Verona. Oh! So looking back, how should we interpret the ending of 10 Things I Hate About You? Has Kat the Feminist been tamed by a man? Or has she instead met her match, who spurs her to be even more staunchly herself? You're not afraid of me, are you? Afraid of you? Why would I be afraid of you? Well, most people are. Well, I'm not. Here's our take on the deeper message of 10 Things I Hate About You, and why Kat is still a rom-com feminist icon today. We're making mistakes. Oh, goody! Something new and different for us. If you're new here, be sure to subscribe and click the bell to get notified about all our new videos. This video is brought to you by Mubi, a curated streaming service showing exceptional films from around the globe. It's like your own personal film festival, streaming anytime, anywhere. Hey there, girlie. How you doing? Sweating like a pig, actually, in yourself. To better understand the deeper roots of Kat and the politics of her love story, we have to look back at her source material. I know Shakespeare's a dead white guy, but he knows his sh In the rom-com's inspiration, Shakespeare's The Taming of the Shrew, a group of suitors long to woo the popular Bianca. I burn. I pine, I perish. I burn, I pine, I perish. But her father won't let her marry until someone weds her older sister, Kate the Cursed, the blunt shrew of the title who detests and horrifies all the men she encounters. I pray you, father, is it your will to make a whore of me among these mates? Like her Shakespearean predecessor, Kat is pegged by her community as a difficult woman because she gives her opinions freely. Yes, miss, I have an opinion about everything. Is excessively blunt. Plus, She's a bitch. And isn't afraid to bite back when provoked. Make anyone cry today? Sadly, no, but it's only 4.30. She also has no interest in men, at least not initially. Now there's a way to get a guy's attention, huh? <sighs> My mission in life. Then enter an unusually arrogant man who's up to the challenge. But I'm sure, you know, the that there are lots of guys who wouldn't mind going out with a difficult woman. Petruchio is incentivized to pursue Kate due to the allure of getting her father's money through marriage, just as Patrick takes an interest in Kat because he's getting paid to. Yet despite her initially vehement resistance, hates him with the fire of a thousand suns. That's a direct quote. To everyone's shock, the headstrong Kate eventually accepts Petruchio's forceful demands of marriage. At the play's end, Kate even instructs other women on how to totally submit to their husbands and perfectly obey their new masters. Come and place your hands below your husband's foot. This ending, and especially Kate's lengthy speech on wifely submissiveness, Thy husband is thy lord, thy life. I keep it. have long been the subject of fierce debate. While a simple literal reading condemns the play as a misogynist text in which the happy ending is Petruchio breaking the spirit of the vile shrew. Catherine, I charge thee, <laughs> tell these headstrong women what duty they do owe their lords and husbands. Many scholars actually read Kate's famous speech as playfully ironic. 
As literary critic Harold Bloom sums it up, their final shared reality is a kind of conspiracy against the rest of us. Petruchio gets to swagger, and Kate will rule him and the household. Love and obey. Bloom and other scholars believe that Kate has been in control the whole time, and that this marriage between equals is a deeply happy one. So is Kate really tamed in the end? Or is she in on the joke, the true queen of her cocky husband? Ten Things I Hate About You has inspired the same diverging interpretations. Kat's happy rom-com ending can be read as sending the depressing message that a fierce feminist must be brought into line by a man, and a world that are uncomfortable with her rage and outspoken ideals. As opposed to a bitter, self-righteous hag who has no friends? But it can also be interpreted as conveying subtler truths about partnership and self-actualization. Kat finds happiness through finally meeting her match. I didn't care about the money, okay? I cared... I cared about you. An equal who appreciates her power and intelligence. Excuse me, have you seen the feminine mystique? I've lost my copy. Who's invigorated instead of terrified by her strength. The only thing people know about me is that I'm scary. Yeah, well, I'm not pitting myself. To fully understand this relationship, let's break down the word taming and what it really means. Or I am he and born to tame you, Kate. Our most common connotations for the word align with the Merriam-Webster definitions. To reduce from a wild to a domesticated state, to bring under control, and to tone down or to deprive of spirit. So you two are going to help me tame the wild beast. But other more nuanced definitions of the word taming have surfaced in literature. In The Little Prince, upon first meeting the prince, the fox requests that the prince tame him. I cannot play with you. I'm not tamed. In the fox's eyes, to tame is to establish ties or intimacy with another. By taming each other, the prince and the fox can form a close, unique bond, distinguishing each other from the thousands of other creatures in the world. To you, I'm nothing more than a fox like a hundred thousand foxes. But if you tame me, then we shall need each other. Cat and Patrick go through the same process of getting to know each other's identity as no one else does. Milwaukee! That's where I was last year. I wasn't in jail. I don't know Marilyn Manson, and I didn't sleep in a Spice Girl. I don't think. How did you get her to do it? Do what? Act like a human. And although they round each other's edges, you're not as mean as you think you are. You know that? And you're not as badass as you think you are. They don't change each other's essential personalities. Rather, each brings the other to a more complete and content self-understanding. Oh my God! Among those who do take the taming of the shrew's ending at face value, some read it as the playwright's commentary on the misogyny of his society. How mean you that? No mates for you unless you would have milder, gentler mold. And in Ten Things I Hate About You, while Cat may be seen as a problem in her society's eyes, Is there any chance we could get Cat to take her Midol before she comes to class? The movie clearly expresses the perspective that really the problem is everyone around her. My insurance does not cover PMS. From the father who's terrified of letting his daughters make decisions about their own bodies. So you can understand the full weight of your decisions. To the nice guy who over idealizes his crush. She's totally pure. To the popular kid who pursues sex as a prize to flatter his oversized vanity. Oh, she's out of reach, even for you. No one's out of reach for me. When Kat tells her sister about her first sexual experience with Joey, she reveals why she's refused to be tamed by this hostile high school environment and its values she doesn't agree with. After that, I swore I would never do anything just because everyone else was doing it. That would be the form of taming that is simply submission and letting someone's spirit be broken. But she does let herself be tamed by Patrick in the Little Prince sense of the word, because he's not a representation of this world which is trying to erase her personality, but an independent and wild spirit like her, who pushes her to channel that spirit into more than just sarcastic contrarianism. So you disappoint her from the start, and then uh, you're covered, right? Something like that. And then you screwed up. How? You never disappointed me. Challenging each other to do the brave work of being vulnerable, of admitting what they really want and care for, is the kind of taming that is really true love. But mostly I hate the way I don't hate you. Not even close. Not even a little bit. Not even at all.
You call yourself a free spirit, a wild thing. And you're terrified somebody's gonna stick you in a cage. Ten Things I Hate About You is far from the first film to feature a taming of the shrew arc. In fact, the rom-com trope of the tough broad softened by love has been the bread and butter of rom-com since its inception. I cannot endure my lady tongue! Come, lady, come! You have lost the heart of Senor Benedict! Plenty of rom-com heroines begin as harsh, tightly wound career women, only to be made more human by love, which helps them understand what really matters in life. Are you supposed to get down on your knee or something? I'm gonna take that as a yes. This broad story breaks down into three subtypes, each one sending a different message about women's liberation and the balance between individual identity and romantic attachments. Maybe you should let somebody help you out every once in a while. <laughs> Definitely not. I've got all of these little balls up in the air. In the first category of the independent woman love plot, the heroine puts a career or higher calling first in her life. I don't know where I'm going to be in five years. And I don't want to know. I want my life to be an adventure. In other words, she puts herself above a man. In more recent stories especially, this can be portrayed as a positive development in the character's arc. Holloway Harris, how may I help you? Of course, please hold for Joan. Or it might be shown sympathetically as a difficult trade-off in a society that still isn't kind to working women. But traditionally, her prioritizing of career over love makes her more or less a cautionary tale. You chose to get ahead. You want this life? Those choices are necessary. Even if she does try to land a man as well, her cutthroat drive simply won't allow space for meaningful relationships or the human warmth they require. You know, you don't get anywhere in this world by waiting for what you want to come to you. You make it happen. The second version of this plot is the working woman who tempers her ambition or is noticeably softened when she finds love. It's a great part and a fine play, but not for me anymore. Not for a four square, upright, downright, forthright married lady. This dominant personality must yield to make room for a man in her life. Yeah, so who's the boss, Andrew? While she might star in a heartwarming or relatable romance, and even still get rewarded with work success in the end, often her story contains some degree of implication that there was something wrong with or too hard about this woman in her starting form, and reinforces the idea that all a woman really needs is love. I realized I had everything I ever wanted, but nothing I really needed. And I think that what I need is here. While Kat could risk falling into the traps of these first two character arcs, instead she best fits into a third category of this plot, one which represents a balance of love and individualism. I'll take the west wing, you take the east wing, and you can be the first gentleman. In this arc, the strong-minded woman finds a partner who admires her career ambitions and strong personality and doesn't want her to change. If there's one thing I know about this business, it's never underestimate what Princess Carolyn can do by herself. Her love interest brings out the best in her, encouraging her to pursue her dreams and realize her potential. I work for Kirsten because I want to write the kind of articles that made me cry when I was a little girl. And Kirsten's the best sports journalist there is. Well, has she read any of your stuff? When Kat lets down her guard and relaxes her most abrasive instincts, this allows for deeper joys in her life, like a positive relationship with her sister. I don't know if I ever thanked you for going last night, but it really meant a lot to me. I'm glad. But that doesn't mean she's changed in the important ways. She doesn't compromise on what she wants and never stops fighting for the ideals she believes in. What about Sylvia Plath or Charlotte Bronte or Simone de Beauvoir? The biggest problem with the first two categories of this plot is that they assume strong-minded women must choose between a false binary of love or ambition. My personal life is hanging by a thread, that's all. No, join the club. That's what happens when you start doing well at work, darling. But while having it all remains an elusive and unrealistic goal for women, that doesn't mean the only other option is a black and white either or. And as Kat demonstrates, falling in love with the right person can actually make us feel more ourselves. A Fender Strat? Is it for me? Yeah, I thought you could use it, you know, when you start your band. From the movie's opening, when Kat blasts feminist rock music next to the car full of popular bubbly blondes, it's clear that she's a different kind of teen rom-com heroine. Romantic? 
Hemingway? He was an abusive alcoholic misogynist who squandered half his life hanging around Picasso trying to nail his leftovers. Kat's punk individualist outlook, her sarcasm and will to speak her mind, and her fearlessness in challenging the wrong structures around her embody the spirit of third wave feminism of the mid-1990s. What did I miss? The oppressive patriarchal values that dictate our education. Good. By making Kat and not the popular, amiable Bianca the protagonist, this story makes the feminist shrew aspirational. No offense or anything. I mean, I know everyone digs your sister, but um, she's without. It asserts that the person we should be aspiring to be like is the smart, independent-minded, angry woman. The one who's controversial, pisses people off, and isn't widely liked. This is so patronizing. Oh, I'll leave it to you to use big words when you're smashed. She's the one who gets the larger-than-life story and romance. Some asshole paid me to take on this really great girl. Is that right? Yeah, but I screwed up. I am. Um, I fell for her. And this progressive lead laid the groundwork for future edgy women to take center stage. My entire generation is a bunch of mouth breathers. They literally have a seizure if you take their phone away for a second. They can't communicate without emojis. To be fair, Kat's feminism isn't perfect. As an upper middle class suburban white woman, she takes it for granted that her privilege will let her get away with a slap on the wrist for her rebellious behavior. You might want to work on that. As always, thank you for your excellent guidance. And while the concept of intersectionality gained prominence as part of third wave feminism, which paid more attention to race and class than earlier feminist movements, Kat herself can be a little tone deaf when it comes to serious issues outside of her limited worldview. But the next time you storm the PTA, crusading for better lunch meat or whatever it is you white girls complain about, ask them why they can't buy a book written by a black man. Despite her faults, Kat remains an aspirational feminist for the ways she resists the conformist pressures of her society and remains true to herself, even when it's hard. I'm a firm believer in doing something for your own reasons and not someone else's. And ultimately, giving Kat the final prize of finding romantic happiness with a pretty irresistible partner. sends the message that being an independent spirit and going against the grain doesn't have to equate to being alone or isolated from others forever. And don't just think you can... So if you too sometimes feel like an alien trapped in a confusing world of people who are wired very differently from you, you can take courage from Kat's example. Expressing my opinion is not a terrorist action. As long as you keep expressing your true voice, eventually you'll find your people and be accepted for who you are. What's the matter, upset that I rubbed off on her? Oh, impressed. Hi everyone, I'm Susanna. I'm Deborah, And we're the creators of The Take. Please subscribe and tell us what you want our take on next. This video is brought to you by Mubi, a streaming service we love. Mubi is a treasure trove of films. Every day, Mubi premieres a new film. Whether it's a movie you've been dying to see or one you've never heard of before, there is always something new to discover. So in this world where it's very easy to spend hours debating what you should watch, Mubi is like having a really cool friend with amazing taste in movies, making it so much easier for you. They feature hard to come by masterpieces, indie festival darlings, influential art house and foreign films, lesser known films by your favorite famous directors, and more. Plus, you can even download the films to watch offline. And there are no ads, ever. This August, Mubi celebrates Lena Vertmuller's 92nd birthday and pays tribute to the legendary filmmaker who was the first woman nominated for the Academy Award for Best Director. This series spotlights her incredible run of polemical films in the mid-1970s, which smashed U.S. box office records for foreign language films. We can't recommend Mubi highly enough. You can try it out now for free for a whole month. Just click the link in the description below.